Okay, everybody, it looks like it's about that time. So thank all of you uh, for taking the time out of your busy days to join us for our session today on the future of work for independent contracting. We've got some amazing guests with us today. Uh, I'm honored to have back with us uh, Jim Harris, who is a uh, world-renowned writer, author, speaker. Uh, we've got the co-founder of Eagle Staff, Kevin B, back with us again. And new this week, uh, we've got a special guest, Michael Lacey, um, who is the um, Chief Sales Officer and Executive VP at Ian Martin, as well as the President of the National Association of Computer Consulting Businesses. So this is Stacy. Uh, yeah, well, thank you guys for joining us. I'm really honored to have you guys with us. Um, and this is stacking up to be a really, really incredible event. Um, we want to make this really interactive, this session. Um, so I really want to encourage everyone to make sure they're making use of Zoom. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the tool or anyone who's having audio problems, you can dial in through your computer audio, uh, or if you're having problems with computer audio, you can dial in. These are the Canadian phone numbers up on the screen, and that's your meeting ID that you'll need to punch in. And you should have a control panel that looks like this with your audio settings that allow you to switch back and forth between computer audio and phone audio, uh, the ability to chat, uh, the ability to raise your hand, and most importantly, uh, the ability to do a QA. and a uh, And like I said, we want to keep this really interactive. We've had a couple of people who've sent in some questions uh, beforehand. Um, and when we did this session last time with Kevin, uh, the feedback was really one of the most valuable aspects of it was just sort of the Q&A and the dialogue, which is why we've, we've gone to sort of a panel format um, this week. And, and the agenda will be an introduction by me. Uh, Jim will give us a great session on thriving through disruption. Um, and if you've seen Jim uh, speak before, you know, he's a great presenter. It's going to be a really amazing uh, presentation full of really interesting slide deck. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun. And when Jim wraps up, we'll go into our panel discussion on the future of work. Uh, we will leave a short Q&A at the end, but we do encourage you to ask questions as we're going through the panel discussion um, to really get this conversation going. Um, to start with a little bit of background on ourselves and why we started putting together these uh, series of webinars um, and content uh, is because when COVID first hit, um, we were getting a lot of questions from the community um, around specific tax issues, whether it's uh, the CERB, the CEBA, uh, the CEWS, the wage subsidies. Uh, so we put together a Facebook group to sort of help and support the independent contracting community to answer these questions. And we were getting a lot of questions around, you know, people who were out of contract, who were looking to uh, make sure their contracts would be renewed. Uh, so we reached out to Kevin and, and we did our first session with Kevin and he gave us some great content on how to stay motivated and how to keep focused. Um, and we wanted to broaden this up and include some other industry legends. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to know a number of great people in the industry. Um, and Kevin and, and Michael both have um, a very long tenure, even though I know they both look like they're 20. Uh, they both have a lot of experience in the industry and an immense amount of value to give back to you guys. Um, which is why we're putting on this this webinar. Uh, if anyone has any other questions and they would like to continue the conversation after this event, um, I do encourage you to come and join our Facebook community. It's facebook.com slash groups slash the self-employed support network. Um, it is open to any and all um, and is there as a community to help support the independent contractors, uh, which we ourselves have been working with for, for over 30 years. Um, so with that, I don't want to spend too much time belaboring um, what we do. I want to get back to adding value to you guys, which is the reason that we're all here. And for those of you who haven't heard uh, Jim speak before, um, he is uh, used to speaking to very large audiences around the world. Um, he speaks to uh, audiences in the thousands. He's done hundreds, if not thousands of presentations, um, as well as written a number of best-selling books. Uh, including Blindsided and The Learning Paradox. I think, Jim, you've actually written over six books. Is that is that correct? Um, I think you're muted at the moment. Let me let me get you unmuted. No, no, I, exactly right, Andrew. So thank you, Jim. It's, it's an honor to have you back again. I, I thank you uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop my share so that you can open it up and um, share with us your pearls of wisdom.
Fantastic. Well, we're going to have uh, fun today. It's going to be a really intense session. And I'm uh, so excited to hear the panel upcoming. If anybody wants to email me at any time, it's just jim at jimharris.com afterwards. Of course, I'm on LinkedIn. Send me a connection request. Uh, mention the seminar here and your network will instantly grow by 27 million people. And if anybody's tweeting today, it's just at Jim Harris. I have a really great feeling that the discussion is gonna be very, very rich in the panel immediately following uh, this presentation. So this is a cartoon that came out from The New Yorker. It's by David Cypress. It just kills me. It's a guy at his desk at home saying, I can't remember. Do I work at home or, or, or do I live at work? I'm not really sure right now. <laughs> you know, we're all in this together. Back in December uh, 2019, Zoom had 10 million daily users, okay? And in April, that had skyrocketed to 300 million daily users. So my question is, how many companies during COVID have experienced a 30x growth in their customer count? I'm going to be arguing today that COVID has hypercharged digital transformation. And companies that are embracing digital transformation are embracing uh, mobile first and embracing AI, embedding these in all their processes and business strategies are just rocking it. And those that are resisting these trends are being crushed. You know, the analysis is just out for Q2 uh, download of apps and uh, Zoom was downloaded 300 million times in the quarter. So on iOS, on the Apple Store, uh, App Store, it was downloaded 94 million times. Just to put that into perspective, Pre-COVID, the most number of downloads ever for a non-gaming app was 50 million. So it's basically doubled that record. And when you add it in with uh, you know, Google Play, it's 300 million. This is the number of daily downloads of Zoom compared to all the other teleconferencing apps. It's basically being downloaded at 3 million every single day during the pandemic. Like 6X, the next best uh, teleconferencing app. So my question is, I know many thin uh, financial institutions that are saying you cannot use Zoom, okay? You can only, it's not secure. That's to me, like that's like financial institutions saying you cannot use the telephone. Do not only use telegraph to reach your customers because the telegraph is more secure. Like, hello, wake up at what point when, you know, Zoom has, you know, 4.2 billion uh, installs, are you then going to allow people to use, access your customers via Zoom? We have to really question policies and procedures during this thing. Uh, something that's interesting is that the average North American worker spends five work weeks a year commuting to work, like five work weeks a year in traffic jams. Like, is there nothing better we can do with our time? Companies prohibited people from working from home pre-COVID. Now they've learning, they've learned that people can be productive from home. So do you know that in the GTA, just in Toronto, we waste $10 billion of time every single year in traffic jams? How do we begin to reframe that? I was working with the top 1% of insurance uh, salespeople across Canada, and many of their companies prevented them from selling virtually. You know, so I'd have to drive two hours out past Waterloo to meet a prospect, hopefully sign a deal and come back. That's five hours out of my day to meet one prospect. Well, now I can uh, pitch eight prospects using Zoom from my home. In fact, I can increase my sales uh, if I begin to think differently about how this pandemic uh, should shift our policies and procedures in our company. This is, uh, you know, uh, first Canadian place at the corner of King and Bay. And uh, this 72 uh, story tower houses 10,000 people. Okay, think about the impact on commercial real estate. I don't know if you know, but the policy right now is 
uh, only two people can get in an elevator at once. So you, sh you show up at First Canadian Place and you wait three hours to get up to the 72nd floor. And then it's just time for lunch. So you head back down to the food court. That's another three hours. You have your lunch and then it's three hours back to the office and then you're done for your day. Like what's going to be the impact on commercial real estate value if uh, you know companies downsize their square footage by 50% and allow half their staff to work from home. Do you know Dell Computers? Dell has 165,000 staff and they have said that 50% of them are never, never, ever, ever coming back to work. So what happens to commercial real estate? Google has said to all its people, uh, nobody's coming back to the office till at least July 2021. Now, for all the independent contractors here, think about this. If you work in the U.S., you need to have a visa, right, to cross the border. But if you're going to be telecommuting, what kind of visa do you need to have to work remotely for Dell in Austin or in uh, this is their research facility in Silicon Valley? What's the impact on contractors? This blows me away. This is the valuation of Amazon today compared to eight other retailers added together. And you can take these eight retailers, add them together, triple it, and it's still worth less than Amazon. So if you are maybe in retail and thinking that e-commerce or uh, um, you know online shopping isn't gonna make a huge difference, think again. You know, at the end of last year, Am, uh, Amazon had really driven the trend of e-commerce and online shopping, not just Amazon, but others. 16.3% of all retail sales in the U.S. were by online shopping, e-commerce. Uh, here's a graph of what happened in COVID. This one blows me away. In COVID, we saw e-commerce spike so profoundly that it grew more in 90 days than the prior 10 years, okay? Back to my thesis that COVID has hypercharged digital transformation, mobile first, and AI being embedded in every single policy procedure that you can implement. During COVID, Amazon has had to hire 175,000 people just to keep up with the order volumes. Like, so my question is, how many companies do you know that have hired 175,000 people during COVID? Again, back to the thesis. This is hypercharging, digital transformation, mobile first and AI centric. Meanwhile, all the companies that are resist those trends, bankruptcy, JCPenney, Pier One, J.C. Crew, Neiman Marcus in Canada, Reitman's. In fact, UBS, the Swiss analyst firm, predicts that 100,000 U.S. retail locations will shutter as a result of COVID. 100,000 retail locations. Wow. Now, if you're interested in some of the things we've been uh, talking about here, you can email me, jim at jimharris.com, and I'll send, you a, uh, I'll send you a copy of this cover story. I'm going to ask, uh, you know, the panel here, you can all unmute. Um, yeah, what, what do you think? Uh, you know, they sent a, a professional photographer to my office to take 300 pictures of me, and this is the one they picked for the cover. So I want to ask you guys, do I A, look sinister, uh, B, do I look evil like Dr. Evil, or C, demonic? What do you think? Is there a D all the above? Uh, Michael D, all the way the above, you got it. <laughs> I'm going demonic. <laughs> demonic. <laughs> I, I still say White Walker. Look like a White Walker. Oh, oh, my God. So <laughs> if anybody wants a copy of this, uh, this will be available afterwards. So I want to look at what's possible and what's impossible. This is how long it took different technologies to reach 50 million customers. It took the airline industry 68 years. And it took Pokemon Go 19 days. What I'm saying here is if you haven't put mobile first at the center of your business strategy, if your clients who you uh, contract to haven't done that, 
this is the problem. They get disrupted, they get blindsided. Because once you are mobile centric, you can experience this kind of scale that Pokemon Go did. Here's another thing that's impossible. If you take Ford, add it to GM, add it to Fiat Chrysler, add those three together and multiply by four, they're worth less than Tesla is today. In other words, Tesla is worth four times more than all the legacy Detroit automakers added together and multiplied by four. So if you don't think digital transformation is going to affect the auto industry, transportation, the $10 trillion global transportation industry, think again. Now, what's driving all this is an exponentially uh, changing set of laws like Moore's Law. Uh, you know, Moore's law is the CPU power will double every 18 months, staying at the same price point. And practically what that means is back in 1970, there were 2,000 chips on an Intel CPU. And today it's 43 billion. And what that means is the price of compute power has plummeted back in 1961 to do one gigaflop, which is doing a billion transactions in a single second was $153 billion. And this year it's a half cent. And that's like so 2020 a figure because next year it's gonna be a quarter cent, right? We'll look back to all oh, that expensive compute power in 2020, it's a quarter cent. And so what that means is compute power is basically free and it's at the edge. And what does at the edge mean? Means it's on my mobile. It means that every single one of your Customers, if you are mobile centric, is carrying around a supercomputer in their hip pocket. When IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov in chess in 1997, that was a hundred million dollar project. And uh, it, it, it blew Gary Kasparov away. He was shocked. But that hundred million dollar project, that hundred million dollar supercomputer, has less power than my smartphone, my thousand dollar smartphone has more raw computing power than a hundred million dollar supercomputer from 1997. That blows me away. So we have to be mobile centric. And it's not just that compute power is cheaper, lighter, faster, smaller, more versatile, more apps, more accuracy. It enables new business models and different ways of interacting with the customer. Think about this. Facebook has announced Libra. They haven't launched it, they've announced it, and it's a cryptocurrency. Imagine sending and receiving money to anybody who's on Facebook is as easy as instant messaging in a year or two. Will that threaten credit card companies? Will that threaten PayPal? Will that threaten financial institutions? If you're not focused on the future, if you're not focused on disruption, how these trends are impacting, you can get blindsided. I'm gonna to argue today that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. I know uh, insurance companies that did not allow for electronic signatures pre-COVID. You had to meet face-to-face, -face. you had to have a frickin' pen and sign your insurance policy with ink because that's the only thing that counts. Well, COVID hit and their business went to zero. And all, all of a sudden, years of the legal and compliance department saying you have to use a pen disappeared overnight because they realized their business was gonna to go to zero and all their competitors that allow these signatures were gonna kill them. So my question is, was that policy for decades of having to use a pen, was that really based in law? Or was this a functional system, a policy and procedure prohibiting a company from moving into the 21st century. So DocuSign has exploded. Look at the stock price. And I have to disclaim, I used to hold stock in uh, DocuSign pre-IPO. I don't hold it anymore. So uh, just for disclosure purposes. So let's look at this. We're having fun here. Think about this. Do you know that a company that is mobile centric, that IPOs has a valuation that is 825% higher than a company that has no mobile presence at all. 825% higher on IPO. How much data do we need to say that we have to be mobile centric? I don't know, so why is mobile centric so important? First off is scaling, we've already talked about that. 
you know, think about this. Uber is worth more than every taxi cab company in North America added together. And while the taxi cab industry owns billions of dollars of assets in the form of cars and limousines, Uber doesn't own a single one. So it's an asset-led corporation. That just shows how much importance there is in having an app that scales to your valuation. We've already talked about the supercomputer and about Gary Kasparov. If you're not mobile centric, you're choosing not to access the supercomputer in all your customers' hip pockets and purses, right? Think about that, like it is a marketing machine and you're choosing not to use it. Finally, location and expectation. You know, Tinder's got it. If you want a date, right? Tinder tells you it geolocates everyone near you. Well, all, all of a sudden, companies that do things like Kijiji and eBay are saying, why don't we geolocate people? You wanna need a new couch? You wanna sell your old couch? You know, you geolocate people for, you know, peer-to-peer -peer commerce. So it enables all sorts of new relationships. And, you know, who's closest to the future? The 65-year-old CEO who doesn't know how to turn on a computer or the 18-year-old who's on Tinder? You know, who does all the strategic planning? Who's most disenfranchised from strategic planning? Is it any wonder that large organizations only get incremental change? This is why we need millennials and Gen Zs involved in our design teams, right? If you're a millennial or a Gen Z, you use the smartphone for everything. Photos, gaming, texting, sexting, dating, moving, music, maps, weather, research, health and fitness, transport, bike sharing, Uber, ride sharing, reading, work and leisure, payments, social, you know, navigation, investing. And you sometimes use it as a phone because it's a phone too. Isn't that nice? So really for the millennial, for the Gen Z, the Swiss army knife is, uh, you know, the smartphone is a Swiss army knife. It is essential to my life. So companies that choose not to be mobile centric, I find it surprising. This, I was at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. It wasn't shut down yet. The next year's one in 2021 will be virtual. This is the smallest AI chip in the world. It can get embedded in any device. It's so small. Hu very little power, inexpensive in uh, huge quantities. And uh, it's getting embedded. Uh, smart AI chips are getting embedded in smartphones more than anything else half a billion units this year to a billion in 2024. So what it really means is that our smartphones are getting smarter. And what does that mean in the COVID crisis? Well, we're medicalizing the smartphone. You know, think about this. Uh, Cambridge University has an app that listens to your breathing and coughing and tells you if you have COVID because it has a database of all sorts of people pre-having uh, pre COVID, post-having COVID. It uses AI to, to, to warn you if you maybe should get a, a COVID test or self-isolate. Think about this, a high-res camera, and my uh, Huawei has a 40 meg high-res camera of the eye, a picture of the eye can determine the gender and age of the individual, their blood pressure, whether they're a smoker, are they at risk of stroke, uh, at risk of a heart attack. So we're seeing the medicalization of the smartphone. And uh, in China during COVID, three, uh, 300 million users were using this app, which is uh, translated is Ping a Good Doctor. Telemedicine is exploding as a result of COVID. Because like, who really wants to go sit in the doctor's office with other people coughing, you know, in fear of catching COVID? So we're gonna see an explosive growth in telemedicine. And this is the cost of not paying attention to change. This is in New York City, the largest US taxi market. Yellow cab declines, Uber explosive growth and Lyft to a point where uh, a taxi medallion is now worth 90% less than it was in 2013. This is the cost of not paying attention to disruption. Now, what about us personally? This is a McKinsey study that came out six days ago. Sorry, you know, I have some dated information here. It's six days old. But if you're in IT, you'd better be reskilling. You know, you, especially in COVID, and it's not just technical reskilling, it's how to sell too. 
In other words, this isn't about technology, it's about people, it's about culture, it's about changing policies and procedures like DocuSign for insurance companies. In other words, you may have to improve your negotiation skills as a contractor as much as you need to improve your technical skills. And this is from the World Economic Forum. And, and this was pre-COVID, okay? Everyone needs an extra 20 days of learning and development in order to stay ahead of the curve. This is everyone, okay? And if you're in a hot, fast changing environment, you might need more. This is the average, you might need more. A couple of final things before turning it over to this most exciting panel. This is the CEO of Salesforce. And Mark uh, admitted on a CEO call that 36% of Salesforce's 50,000 staff are experiencing mental health challenges. Like, and Salesforce is growing during COVID. So if you're stressed in a growing company, think about how you're stressed if you're worried about being laid off or where's my paycheck gonna come from? So we have to focus on our mental health. We have to exercise. We have to you know, socialize with people. We have to have a support network. Um, so we need to do all sorts of things to take care of ourselves. And companies need to take care of their people. And that's why this seminar today that uh, these three amazing gentlemen are putting on is so important. We need to communicate with each other more in the community, not less as a result of COVID. So um, this is how you reach me again, jim at jimharris.com. If you want a copy of uh, this, I think it was slated as demonic, okay, demonic uh, article, you know, email me or connect on LinkedIn. There's also an article I've just written for Disruption Magazine, which is kind of the basis of what I talked about today. I'll send that to you. I also want to put in a thanks to Rachel, who's a behind the scenes person here at uh, CPA for IT. And uh, it's been my honor to be on this uh, session. I am so looking forward to the panel because we got uh, three super smart guys who are going to talk to us about what's changing in the community. And I'm going to throw it back to you, Andrew. Oh, thanks, Jim. That was uh, another amazing session. You definitely brought it with some really great, great content um, that I think really spurs the conversation about what the future of work is going to look like for the independent consulting. Uh, we're going to open it up to our panel now. Again, I want to encourage anyone, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A feature to, to share your uh, questions, and we'll do our best to get through those as we go. Um, I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions. Uh, Michael, you can give us a little bit of bit a little bit about your background. I know you've been in the industry for a long time, but I'm not sure everyone knows exactly how well versed you are and how knowledgeable you are in this industry. Terrific. Well, thanks, Andrew. And uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here today. i um, really been looking forward to this. So thanks for the invitation. Um, yes, I've been in this uh, industry, crazy industry called the uh, technology staffing for about 25 years now. I've uh, only worked for a few companies, but worked all over North America. Uh, currently, I'm with the Ian Martin Group as the Chief Sales Officer and Executive Vice President. Uh, my role there is really to build our brand, but more specifically, is really work and build the relationships with our clients throughout North America, and really to develop our new business strategy as we continue to grow. Um, I also wear a second hat in my other job, which is the President of our National Association, the uh, National Association of Community Consulting Businesses. And that's really an association that works with organizations like Eagle and Ian Martin and others. And that's really to provide uh, guidance and around the changing landscape of legislation that's going on in the industry and really representing the independent contractor as well and making sure that, you know, things and changes that are happening both at the provincial and federal level uh, that could potentially impact the industry, uh, we're staying abreast of and as well just lobbying to make sure that the, the independent contractor is uh, status is alive and well. Yeah, and, and you know, many of you may not even realize about all the behind the scenes battles that are going on uh, by key people like Kevin and Michael to help ensure that we can remain as independent contractors. Uh, because in the US, that battle has been uh, not very successfully won by the independent contractors. You look at California and what's gone on with Uber, and they've made all Uber 
independent contractors, employees in California. Um, and, and there is a very rare, very real risk that that could happen at any point in Canada. And if it weren't for people like Kevin and Michael and all the other members from that NACCB, um, who are working together to educate policymakers, uh, to educate CRA, to educate the government on why independent contracting is good for the client, good for the candidate, uh, and good for the entire Canadian economy. Uh, there's a very real possibility that, that that could shrivel up and die one day be, because we might have a, um, you know, a, a leader who's trying to, uh, to see, who sees this as low hanging tax revenue that they could collect, not recognizing, you know, the downstream effects of where this money actually ends up going back into the economies. But um, I'm going to digress on that because that's that I'll get on my soapbox if I get onto that topic too much. Uh, but Kevin, what, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background as well? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I've been in the industry about the same length of time as Mike. Uh, in 1996, I had the opportunity to start Eagle. It was a spin out from Anderson Consulting, now known as Accenture. Uh, so we've been in business about 25 years. We're a national company. We, uh, um, you know, service mostly the large clients uh, uh, in this industry, and we deal a lot, almost exclusively, with independent contractors. Um, I was very involved with the industry association. I was on the board of uh, the larger Access organization for about 11 years and on the board of NACCB for five years. Been involved in most of the fights in this industry around retail sales tax in Ontario, around the personal services uh, businesses uh, fight with CRA. Um, probably get involved in the upcoming one about uh, the uh, Employment Standards Act and how it applies to independent contractors. Um, it's important, I think, that, that we're into that battle and doing it. So that's, it's a passion for me. I, I love this industry. I say 25 years in it now. So uh, that's me, what I do. Well, thank you both of you for, again, for joining us, sharing your background. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to have you guys on to discuss what, what the future of independent contracting work looks like. I mean, I guess neither of us have a crystal ball, so I don't expect you to hit it, you know, hit the nail on the head, but I just love your interpretations of, you know, where we're going to be in the next two to five years and what impacts that uh, is going to have. I mean, Jim talked about how, you know, the, the future of work in an office space. We know Dell's said they're, you know, only half of their workforce are ever going back. If, if, if ever, um, you know, we're lucky to have an IT industry where people can work from home, um, but that's not always been the case. Um, and, and what's your perspective? Do you think that that will remain like that? Will people always be working from home? What will happen when COVID starts to settle down? I'll start with that. So it, it's been a real interesting transformation since COVID hit, I have to admit. Um, when you take a look at the last six months, I my first belief was that our industry as a whole was going to suffer greatly. I thought it was going to be an absolutely mass shutdown similar to you know the great depression that just occurred in 2008 2009 as well as kind of the y2k meltdown that occurred as well but it didn't happen and i think the reason why it didn't especially in the it sector is overall i think we've been down about 10 percent uh year over year and that's primarily because technology has really caught up and allowed efficiencies and productivity gains i think organizations also looked at it as a, a center that was extremely important to organizations. And so they did everything they could to keep business up and running and allow that workforce to go and redeploy themselves and work from home. And the technology has really allowed that to happen. Without Zoom, without Teams, you know, 10 years ago, this never would have occurred. It would have da damaged the industry as a whole. So I think technology has played a large part of that. I do believe that at some point we will make our way back to the office. And I think it's going to be twofold. Number one, not because people have to, it's because people will want to. It's people like the social aspects of working together. Um, they are more productive, you know, mentally. It's great when you've got your work, work life and all of that going on. Um, at the same time, though, I think flexibility is now going to be built into our work model. And, you know, I think it's something like COVID 
that came along and allowed organizations to start trusting not only their employees, but their actual contingent workforce as well. And they've really been seeing that, you know, over a six month period, productivity gains have either gone up or at least has stabilized. They certainly haven't gone backwards, which means there's a trust that's been built into these relationships. And so I do believe that it will continue throughout. Um, I think today, while the majority of people are working remotely, it has more to do with because quite frankly, we just don't wanna get COVID and it's also the right thing to do for the community. But more importantly, I think there will be a plan to get back, but it's not gonna be a mandated plan to get back. I think people are gonna be given that flexibility. Muted myself. Um, I know even within our own organization, um, you know, we had um, a sort of social gathering, of, you know, social distance social gathering, uh, because we were people were saying they were craving that, and you know, I think there's there's been lots of conversations going on about um, the difficulty that um, you know people with young families are having dealing with schools and education. There really hasn't been that much about all the young single people and how they're struggling mentally as well, um, but. Everyone, I think, whether you have families, whether you're single and alone, um, are struggling with, you know, managing the stress of, of being stuck at home and craving the ability to be back with a team. So I think that there, we've learned that there may not be a necessity to have a physical office from a productivity standpoint, but from a mental health standpoint, it's cer certainly proving to be a really important part of our job. Um, and that social aspect is really important to us as human beings. I guess the next question I might have um, is, you know, does this uh, evolution of work change the skill sets that are required for the job? Um, are, are the same skills that were in demand pre-COVID in demand post-COVID? Has that, has that shifted at all? Um, I'll jump on that one if I might. I think that um, we've, got to, we've got to remember COVID is a point in time. So it's, yes, huge disruption, which always creates an innovation opportunity and um, also changes what the demand is in the short term. But the long term, the long term is the same. We have the same drivers uh, in the future as we had before pre-COVID. You know, the, the evolving new technologies, the AIs, the machine learning, the, the, uh, the mobile, there's, there's a lot of stuff that is going to be just the same when we get back to sorting this all out. So, you know, as an independent contractor, there's, there's a whole bunch of, of other factors in here. The flexibility that independent contractors bring to the clients is what really makes them valuable to be able to bring skills in as needed, when needed for just that period of time is really valuable. And that's going to continue to be valuable. I think through COVID, we've seen some, organizations that have adapted better than others and we've seen some that have taken different approaches and how they cut cost and that kind of stuff but ultimately i think that the value that the independent contractor brings to the canadian economy is just going to in increase we're also going to see more demand because the big global companies that already have huge presence in the u.s are having problems with immigration they're having problems with the size and, and location of their places so they're opening up here they're, they're they're looking at canada you've got a more affordable workforce a highly motivated and skilled workforce and so they're coming here in droves too so that's going to create even more opportunity you've got people like me like I, I took exception to Jim saying about those 65 year old guys who can't turn their computer on i know where the on switch is anyway so uh, <laughs> But, you know, we're retiring, like people of my age are retiring and that's creating opportunities. So there's, a, there's just more and more opportunity. Yeah. I know that a lot of, I've talked to a lot of contractors and they're a bit concerned right now, but no need to be concerned. It's coming back, it's going to come back in, in spades and it's going to be what you, what you saw before um, times 10. I think that, that, sorry, go ahead, Michael. I, I was just going to add, you know, I, I know early on when COVID hit, um, you know, working Tuesday and Wednesday, ended up working Saturday and Sunday. And quite frankly, I couldn't tell, you know, what, for what was Friday and what was Sunday anymore. But I also believe it inherently built this great flexible work opportunity for people. And, you know, while people had this flexibility to take care of their family, take care of their health, but also take care of work, 
I also saw a number of contractors who typically had, you know, one engagement were now able to take on more opportunities to grow their businesses. And so I think it's been a great opportunity just to rethink your current business model and to really pivot, think outside the box and really go and, and grow during these times. And as Jim's shown, there are companies out there that are absolutely thriving, but those are the organizations that put the time and effort in to kind of look at this, but had also built in a, a business model that said, you know, whatever happens, we've got the flexibility and agility to kind of move uh, depending on whatever the circumstances are. And so quite frankly, this has been a great opportunity. Our organizations, we've got uh, 400 employees around the world, 2000 contractors out working. And literally within 48 hours, we had our entire workforce working remotely. And, you know, it's just been a great opportunity to try different things. And those that companies invested in technologies have been able to th thrive. And I think the independent contractors, similarly, those who have had the skills and the experience to kind of get through or been through these kind of downturns are kind of working their way through this and will come out the other side that much better. So I guess that brings to, to a really good question that we had before is what are the skills that are actually in demand today? Um, you know, and what are like the top job opportunities as project managers or developers? What are the, what are the hot skills and job opportunities? Em, do you want to take this or do you want me to take it? Yeah, sure. No, no problem. I'd, love I, to I'd actually love to yeah. hear from both of you. We will. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, so there's been a, a number of, of, uh, studies come out just recently even during covid showing what's in demand right now so comp tia just listed the, the top 10 in demand skills i mean the top three were ai uh, 5g and iot they, they had blockchain at number seven um to me these these are all exciting new interesting to be honest as a, as a supplier in the in the it contracting business my clients are asking me for PMs and BAs and for full stack developers and Java guys. So, so that, you know, yes, we're going to move towards those bleeding edge type technologies and demand for that, but it's going to take some time to come. So um, I, I think, you know, you, you, what you see in the reports is what people want the exciting things to be. And, and I think the reality of it is that, that bread and butter skills are still in huge demand. Mike, and, and so I, I would, you know, uh, say very, very similar, um, you know, the typical functional roles, business analysts, project managers, those that need a lot of analysis and management are always going to be in demand. So I would say anybody that can continue to work on communication skills, skills are going to absolutely be in demand. When you get into, you know, software development, cybersecurity, uh, UI, UX, um, uh, big data, those are absolute skills as well. We're, our organization, not only do we IT, but we also do engineering and we do skilled trades. So on that side, we've seen a huge demand in the skilled trade with, within the manufacturing space. As those businesses are now coming back from China, et cetera, we're now seeing many of the clients demanding for those typical trade skills like plumbers and electricians, assemblers, uh, mechanics, et cetera, there is going to be a huge demand for that. So people who want to maybe pivot within their current space, instead of maybe using their mind, they want to maybe pivot to using their hands. Um, those are going to be, I think, opportunities for them as well. Right. And I guess it sort of goes without saying that uh, tied into any technical uh, skill or, or opportunity in this day and age requires a lot of um, social training and social skills as well because i can't imagine that even you know for a full stack developer you've got to be client facing there's no longer this concept of sitting in a back room and coding all day or or am i wrong on that perception so so i i would say with the advent of you know zoom and teams and all of that actually people have to be much more social i think because we're now working in a remote environment new and different ways to engage in order to make sure that projects are running on time, people are meeting their deliverables, etc. All of those things require people, yes, not living kind of in the back rooms, it's they have to come 
be forefront. And so again, communication skills, be willing to kind of express themselves, which maybe they didn't need to in the past, are definitely needed uh, for the new environment today. I'll share a whole bunch of these uh, studies that I've gotten um, after this session, like I did last time. But there was one that was of interest to me with, from the Business Talent Group 2020 report. And, and when you look at many of the skills they're looking for, market landscaping research, process optimization, project management, the t on, in the top 10 most in-demand skills for 2020, number 10 was project management office. So again, all of those skills do require great interpersonal skills. They require great time management. They require all the soft skills that you, you know, presentation skills. So there's this kinds of skills that if you as an independent contractor are looking to up your game and go to the next level, you've really got to, as Jim mentioned in his presentation, if without these soft skills, you're really going to be left behind. Yeah, and I, and I just want to jump in on this this point for a second to say some people have said, you know, I don't have work right now, but so many institutions have made their educational component free during COVID. Now is the perfect time to upskill, right? Uh, do a negotiation course, do some of these soft skill courses Kevin just mentioned. And, and I'll even throw on top, there are more and more organizations whether it's skills, functional, technical, that are starting to require certification. And I think, again, during this time, it's a fantastic time to either upgrade your certifications, get recertified, or go get service certified for the first time. When you do have those certifications, you are kind of moving yourself up. Um, clients are looking for those types of things in the future. And so I think that just will help you as well and probably increase the value of your services. Right. I, I would imagine as an employer, just demonstrating that you're continuing to improve and develop new skills is an indication of the type of person that you are that's constantly learning and growing and type of character. Um, I guess the one question I do have when it comes to certifications, because we've got this in the past, like how do employers balance certification versus years of experience? Um, because obviously I can imagine you can have a certification, but with zero experience, you know, you'd probably be ranking lower on the totem than someone who has a year or two of experience but no certification. Like, how does that end up balancing out with employers? Can I have a go with that one? Uh, when I worked for Anderson Consulting, one of the big things as a global consulting company they used to espouse and, and buy into was experience needs to be real. So if you, if you did the same job for the last five years, do you have five years experience or do you have one year's experience five times? So uh, what a certification does for you is it, it demonstrates that you know the stuff. It demonstrates that you've understand it. So you may well have been working in cloud for five years, but do you, did you do anything with serverless cloud? Did you do anything with the latest technologies? If you've got the certifications, you can talk about what you know about that. So I think it's important that way, just an example. Yeah. And I will say in the area of like skilled trades, as an example, because of the high risk nature of that uh, environment, you want those certifications. It's not just about the actual experience, the certification, staying on top, the latest uh, you know, ways of going about things. And so it reduces the potential overall risk. So it's a balance, as, as Kevin mentioned. It's really about, you know, yes, have being certified, but more importantly, or as important, is also having that hands-on experience. Right. And, and how competitive is the job, job landscape uh, at the moment? I know we go through these ebbs and flows where there's, you know, sometimes more candidates than opportunities, sometimes more opportunities than candidates. What, where are we on that, on that wave right now? Are, are we, um, are there, I'm imagining that there's probably just an opportunity. Is that a safe assumption or is that a flawed assumption? Kevin, do you want to go or do you want me yeah. to go? I'm good. I mean, um, like I said before, we're in, we're in a point in time crisis, and and that means that you know companies have let people go. So yes, I would say today we're in a candidate-rich environment, less demand. I would say Eagles, uh, the orders we get on a monthly basis over the last four months were down probably about fifty percent in terms of demand that we were before. Heading into COVID. It was exact opposite. We had a huge 
skills shortage and we will be back there we will right. get back to that and that's going to be a different issue and i'm sure the people on this call would sooner be back there than where we are today yeah. <laughs> So, so I would just add to that. So what I saw pre-COVID, we were probably having in the last five years kind of the best year. Um, certainly not enough potential candidates for the jobs that we had. Uh, and, and the job requirements were just continuing to grow month over month. The minute COVID hit, we dropped almost 70% of the order volume. Uh, I would say we're back up, as Kevin has alluded to, about 50 to 60% of where we were. But the one thing I will say is while the candidates, um, while the job orders are starting to return, we never saw the candidate kind of, you know, leave their positions. And so yeah. quite frankly, the demand is still there. Um, I would say, again, overall, over the last six months, we're only down about 10, eight to 10 percent. And which meant our clients understood, as Kevin's always said, this was a point in time. And you could take two potential paths. You could kind of try and save cost now, which is to release your contingent workforce, which is why they're there, supply and demand, or knowing that this is going to come back and business will return and having to go and hunt and, and compete for that talent. Most of the clients had really tried to get their arms and find ways to engage and keep those contractors. And so that's why I said right now, there's still not enough people, even with the lower job requirements, um, to fill the demand that we do have. We've even seen some clients who have pivoted and, you know, the demand has gone where they're giving us orders for 200, 300 people. There is not enough people to fill those positions. So it's, it's been an interesting ride for the last six months. Yeah, it, it is really unusual times. Uh, hopefully we'll never see times like it again. Uh, I'm a firm believer in, in that it's back. And when I can, is, I, I sort of can echo what you guys have said. Uh, all of our contractors or, or clients who are contractors um, who were on contract, they haven't, uh, very, very few of them had their, had their contracts terminated, which is interesting because if you think about the contingent workforce, you're absolutely right, Mike. The, in theory, those, that's the first people to be, to be cut. Um, but very few of my client base weren't. Um, and they've been able, yes, they're, those who weren't on contracts, finding new opportunities, um, you know, those, I think everyone just went on a flat hiring freeze because they're like, we don't know what's going on. We're still trying to figure it out. And months later, we're still trying to figure it out. When that certainty will come into place, I, I'm not sure. But I, I mean, I can't imagine that this is going to go on too much longer because organizations need to be constantly improving and constantly keeping up because you know you look at these organizations that jim talked about today and the evolution going on in technology you got to keep up you can't right. stop stop the the momentum of what you yeah you can only put projects on hold for so long and so as such and we've seen this especially in the financial services you know when the downturn happened they put projects on hold for a year or two but i'll tell you coming back was just absolutely crazy trying to find the talent again. And so I think clients learned the lesson from the last downturn to, you know, rather than having to compete in the future, let's just figure out ways. And there are ways that we can all work together kind of when we're in this, you know, whether it was rate reductions or not for a small period of time, but we are starting to see those companies that said, hey, we need to take, you know, do some creative things, move payment terms, move, you know, rates, you know, are starting to now come back again and changing those. Right. And you know, and, and this, uh, I want to circle back to something that you touched on, um, Kevin, and, and even that was in theory a theme of, of uh, Jim's per, uh, presentation, which is the idea around globalization. Because um, we had some questions the, before the session about working in the U.S. And I know over the years, again, we've seen that ebb and flow where Know, the U.S. are hiring a bunch of Canadians. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Historically, that's been tied to uh, the Canadian dollar or the U.S. dollar and, and, and the exchange rate between the two. Um, I guess, what are your thoughts on, you know, when hiring comes back, where we start to see, you know, now that more companies are recognizing that, hey, I don't need my guys physically coming in as often. I might need them to fly down for a team meeting uh, or sessions every couple of months. Uh, but I don't need them in the office every day. Will we start to see a bigger shift of Americans hiring Canadians or, or I mean, I, I guess anyone outside of Canada hiring Canadians? Um, 
I mean, Mike has a U.S. operation, so maybe you you might be better yeah. positioned to. So, so I, I what I can say is this: is we've got, um, I would say, fifteen percent of our entire workforce is probably as we define it as cross-border work, right. uh, and so they're currently working in Canada, but for projects in the United States. And so as organizations um, are continuing to demand certain skills, they will look. And because of, call it remote workforce now, there is going to be a greater ability because one, you can't go down to the States. You can't cross the border, number one. Number two, it's harder and harder to get the work visas anyways with the current administration that's in place. And so quite frankly, though, I think there is an openness and an ability to work remotely on US-based projects. And it is recognized that Canada has a well-educated workforce. Um, many, many companies look at this as a wonderful place because of our universities and just the overall talent and access to talent. And it's so close because of the time zones, et cetera, that they can get access to that. So I think there is going to be a tremendous opportunity in the future for Canadian contractors to work and engage. It is happening now. Uh, it wasn't when, I guess, the big ERP systems, that was the big migration that I saw years ago when they were implementing SAP and Oracle, et cetera. And there was a large contingent workforce here in Canada that were then working and flying remotely. Those days aren't there today, but the talent is still here and can be done through technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, companies are opening up shop here so that they yeah. can service their needs uh, from a... A remote location, if you're going to call it that. Of course, Toronto has been the fourth largest city in North America. Calling it a remote location might be strange. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, so we're, we're coming up. we got about four, four, just shy of five minutes left uh, here. I do want to give anyone, if you have a question and you'd like to post it to the group, uh, I do want to make sure that you post it through to the q and I'm just going to take a minute to go through, uh, if you guys don't mind, some of the questions that came through earlier. I think we, we have hit on some of them already. Um, so the first question from Shahid, which was, um, you know, around what skills are most needed for the future contracting jobs, um, which I think we've touched on. Uh, but what we didn't really touch on is maybe the best resources um, and website to, he's asking to find work. And I think I, I can name two right off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> EagleAndMeAndMartin.com. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, what about um, skills or resources uh, for learning, or resources for learning new skills? Because uh, I know, Kevin, you had that list that you shared in the group last time. Do you have any others that you might want to share as a top two or three maybe out of that list? Um, well, many of the world's best universities have put the the content online so yeah. and it's available is that there's there's also you know you know if you're in cloud or you want to you want to you know get certified you you there's there's the places to go for that so it's there's there's so many sources i mean you know in toronto you've got or everywhere you've got toastmasters clubs that can help you improve you your presentation skills that help you improve your meeting running skills and communication skills. Um, you know, there's, there's so many resources out there. Uh, I will again share all of these uh, slides I have with all these um, sources and where it came from and you'll be able to see that kind of stuff too. So, And I would just add the community colleges I find are excellent resources for training ground for individuals uh it can be done at night usually and so or online so i think that's a great opportunity to take a look at you know the nearest community college uh that's in your uh, region and, and kind of feel out them what they've got available uh, so we've got another question here from uh william um he was just asking about um you know for the immigrant population um how do they make independent contracting uh, work as a successful career if you're a new immigrant to Canada. Are there any specific challenges that they face, uh, obstacles that they need to overcome, things that they can do to better prepare themselves for a career in contract? I'll, I'll take a bit of a run at that. Um, listen, let's, it, it's hard getting that first opportunity. Um, but what I will say is in today's work environment, diversity and inclusion are really a hot button topic for clients. And I think today 
more and more companies are open to figuring out ways to identify and work with individuals to give them meaningful work opportunities. And so I just think today's climate, there's an opportunity now, whether you might not have that first Canadian experience, I think companies are going to be op a lot more open to that. So we've got another question that's coming here live. Um, so um, from John who asked, um, what if you're 57 and your skills are outdated? Um, for example, he has mainframe skills, but not necessarily new ones. Um, can and should he be reskilling to compete with the younger generation? Tough question. <laughs> Who'd like to take that one? I, I, I'll jump on it. I, I'm an, I was an IBM assembler programmer uh, working for a bank in England. Um, you, you know, the world is like, we've talked about all day here is, is evolving so fast. You know, those new skills, if you know the old skills, you can learn the new skills yeah. really fast. Uh, age should not be a factor. Like yeah. it, you're as old as you feel like, so just jump on it. Um, there's also demand for those old skills. There yeah. are a lot of, you know, all the banks have huge COBOL systems, uh, government has huge governments and there's lots of that out there so there's there's opportunity there too if you want to stick in that world so it's um it's definitely you know it's your choice i would say go for the new skills but keep in mind that there's still ability to use your old skills yeah it, uh, yeah why 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 2k was amazing for COBOL programmers like you could not get the people you needed because the whole world was going to end when it ticked over to oh oh and uh, man, it was heyday for COBOL programmers around 1999. Yeah. But, but there's still, as Kevin said, there's still opportunities. There are still very large organizations who invested millions or hundreds of millions of dollars in those systems, and they're not going away. In yeah. saying that, I think pivoting is about a mindset. And you know what? Whether you're 57 or 27, if you want to learn something new and you want to go and explore it, just do it. And so I, I think, you know what, do what you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I know we're, we're, we're just over on time. Um, and I just want to close with one last uh, question. Um, is just around um, niching your services. Um, and so this is something that's obviously big in, in the accounting community. But I actually am starting to see it happen within the independent uh, consulting industry. So you might be a project manager specific to banking. You might be, a, and, and sort of the more that you sort of niche your expertise into say mainframe, like the, that you're a mainframe guy and you do mainframe, that building in those niches helps you potentially to build tighter um, communities and relationships because it's ultimately about the relationships that you build um, to help you make sure that those contracts get renewed and that you come up for future projects. What are your thoughts on sort of niching expertise? The weird one outside the box? No, I don't no. think so. I think the, the you know, our, our banking clients want people with banking experience. So, uh, you know, uh, oil and gas clients want people with, you know, the upstream or downstream, whatever it is type of skill. So they look for those niche skills. It doesn't mean you can't cross over. It just means that if they can get them, they want them. Yeah. And, and I would agree with that. Um, I, I would say over the last number of years, it has always been, you know, I need this person, but they have to have capital markets experience. I will say more and more high demand skills are not requiring that functional expertise as much. And I would definitely agree that's more on the technical side, not so much on the functional side, like project managers or BAs. So if you're in that space, I would say continue down the path. But if there are opportunities to kind of broaden your skills outside of just financial, just oil and gas, do so because it just allows you to be open up to a lot more opportunities in the future. Great. Do you guys have, we, we got one more live question that came in. Do you guys have time for one more? Got one more, sure. Um, so uh, it says, I've been in the healthcare IT consultant for over 15 years. Uh, what market demand do you forecast for healthcare IT um, and why go the, and why go via a recruitment agency versus targeting potential clients directly? I, that's a great question, actually. That last little one is a whole other session in its own. And I'm a big advocate. I just want to start by saying 
there's a ton of reasons that you should be going through an agency. Uh, first of all, to make sure that your contracts are actually done properly, not just someone accidentally using an employment contract for an independent contractor contract. Uh, there's uh, independence issues. Uh, there's the fact that they're going to have job opportunities lined up for you when the contract comes up for renewal. That's just my like outsider's perspective why agencies are, are great. Uh, but maybe I'd love to hear from you guys what your perspective on on the value. Well, first of all, I guess whether your outlooks on the healthcare industry and the value of agencies to the independent contractor. Oh, I could speak all day on that. I um, know, and you've got like 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> okay, so big organizations do not want to deal with individuals. They want to deal with an entity that can handle it all for them. So they all have all the big companies now. They That's that's just the way they want to operate. And if, in fact, if, I, if it's government, you have to be on the right? You have to be a vendor yeah. of records. You can't um, even get into the government. If even the big companies, you've got to be on their little vendor list. So yeah. so that's that's part of it. Um, if I am a bank and I am employing a project manager as an employee and I'm employing a project manager as a independent contractor directly, what's the difference? So when, in, you know, when CRA come and look at me, am I independent or not? Through an agency, there's a whole bunch of things that happen that help to maintain that independence. There's, there's a, a million ways. IT, demand, it's only going up. It's going to, there's no shortage of demand in the IT space, in healthcare IT space. So it's going to keep going up. I'm going to echo exactly what Kevin just said. Listen, demand for healthcare as the age continues to, uh, sorry, as the population continues to age, there will be demand. There will be, especially in the IT sector, ways to kind of manage, you know, uh, all sorts of different things. So quite frankly, that's an industry that will continue to grow and working through through an agency, et cetera, is absolutely the right thing to do to make sure that you have that independent contractor status in play. And even Tim, you touched on the importance of healthcare and, and healthcare technology and how that's evolving. So I think that's that's a no brainer that that's, that's an industry that's gonna be doing better. Again, I wanna thank all, all three of you for joining me today. Uh, it's been an amazing session. Um, I really do appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, Michael, I know you probably want to get to the Raptors, get to the Raptors game. I'm sorry you can't. You're not watching live anymore. <laughs> I know, I know. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Go Raptors. Go Raptors. Uh, and thanks everyone. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our guests uh, who tuned in. Um, the recording will be available available on our Facebook page now. We will be sharing out with those of you who attended um, some of the helpful content that Kevin's provided, uh, as well as uh, some free tips and tools from ourselves uh, to help you work better as independent contractors and we encourage you to join us uh, on social media you can hit me uh, on twitter at all cpa uh, kevin i think you're you're kevin d 300 michael you're michael P and jim is uh so reach out connect with us um and uh, we'd love to answer more questions offline so thanks everybody and bye for now thanks everyone bye yes. now. thank you